So good morning and welcome to Seattle Atheist Church. Atheists, agnostics, skeptics, whatever you like to call yourself, you are welcome here. At Seattle Atheist Church, we call ourselves an atheist church because you will never hear anything supernatural promoted from the podium. Our church was founded on the principles of scientific naturalism and secular ethics. Truth claims are attempted here, and we stand ready to revise our thinking in light of new information. We attempt to be excellent to all conscious beings, and we believe in good, because good works in non-mysterious ways. If that sounds right to you, then you are probably in the right place. So, first thing I'd like to do is uh, welcome you here today. We do this every Sunday at noon. Uh, also, next Sunday after church, we're going to go as a group to the reopening of the Burke Museum, which is very nearby. Um, so next Saturday, I mean, sorry, next Sunday at 3 o'clock is board games at the Wayward Coffee House on 65th and Roosevelt. Um, and so... And also, if you would like to support the church financially, your donations go to uh, currently to renting this room. And we do have some stretch goals of possible presence at fairs and things like that. Um, you can see Troy, who is our treasurer, or do that at CLAtheist.church. And there's a jar in the back of the room, too. Thanks very much. Uh, Jack is going to come on up and give us some talk. Hi everyone. Uh, today I'd like to give you a talk about the Robbers Cave Experiment. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to call out that the vast majority of the words here aren't mine. They come from the less wrong post on the topic, with a few very minor edits to make it flow a little more naturally when it's spoken. All right, so let's talk about the Robbers Cave Experiment. Did you ever wonder, when you were a kid, whether your name Summer Camp actually had some kind of elaborate hidden purpose. Say, it was all a science experiment and the camp counselors were really researchers observing your behavior. Me neither. <laughs> but we'd have been a bit more paranoid if we'd read studies called Intergroup Conflict and Cooperation, the Robbers Cave Experiment, by Sharif et al., published in 1954, with a follow-up in uh, 1961. In this study, the experimental subjects, excuse me, campers, <laughs> were 22 boys between 5th and 6th grade, selected from 22 different schools in Oklahoma City of stable, middle-class, Protestant families, doing well in school, median IQ, 112. They were as well-adjusted and as similar to each other as the researchers could manage. The experiment, conducted in the bewildered aftermath of World War II, was meant to investigate causes and possible remedies of intergroup conflict. How would they spark an intergroup conflict to investigate? Well, the 22 boys were divided into two groups of 11 campers, and well, that turned out to be quite sufficient. The researchers' original plans called for the experiment to be conducted in three stages. In stage one, each group of campers would settle in, unaware of the other group's existence. <clears throat> Toward the end of stage one, the groups would gradually be made aware of each other. In stage two, a set of contests and prize competitions would set the two groups at odds. They needn't have bothered with stage two. There was hostility almost from the moment each group became aware of the other group's existence. They were using our camera, our baseball diamond. On their first meeting, the two groups began hurling insults. They named themselves the Rattlers and the Eagles. They hadn't needed names when they were the only group on the campground. When the contests and prizes were announced in accordance with the pre-established experimental procedure, the intergroup rivalry rose to a fever pitch. Good sportsmanship in the contest was evident for the first two days, but rapidly disintegrated. The Eagles stole the Rattlers' flag and burned it. The Rattlers raided the Eagles' cabin and stole the blue jeans of the group leader, <coughs> which they painted orange and carried as the flag the next day, inscribed with the legend, The Last of the Eagles. 
The Eagles launched a retaliatory raid on the Rattlers, turning over beds, scattering dirt. Then they returned to their cabin where they entrenched and prepared weapons in case of a return raid, socks filled with rocks. After the Eagles won the, the last contest planned for stage two, the Rattlers raided their cabin and stole the prizes. This developed into a fist fight that the staff had to shut down for fear of in injury. The Eagles, retelling the tale among themselves, turned the whole affair into a magnificent victory. They chased the Rattlers, they claimed, over halfway back to their cabin. They hadn't. Each group developed a negative stereotype of them and a contrasting positive stereotype of us. The Rattlers swore heavily. The Eagles, after winning one game, concluded that they had won because of their prayers, and the Rattlers had lost because they used cuss words all the time. The Eagles decided to stop using cuss words themselves. <clears throat> they also concluded that since the Rattlers swore all the time, it would be wiser not to talk to them. The Eagles developed an image of themselves as proper and moral. The Rattlers developed an image of themselves as rough and tough. Group members held their noses when members of the other group passed. In stage three, the researchers tried to reduce the friction between the groups. Mere contact, that is, being present outside of the context of a contest, did not reduce friction between the groups. Attending pleasant activities together, for example, shooting off Fourth of July fireworks, did not reduce friction. Instead, it developed into a food fight. Would you care to guess what did work? The boys were informed that there might be a water shortage in the whole camp due to the mysterious trouble with the water system, possibly due to vandals. The outside enemy, one of the oldest tricks in the book. The area between the camp and the reservoir uh, would have to be inspected by four search details. Initially, these search details were comprised uniformly of members from each group. All details would meet up at the water tank if nothing was found. As nothing was found, the groups met at the water tank <clears throat> and observed that for themselves that no water was coming from the faucet. The two groups of boys discussed where the problem might lie, pounded the sides of the water tank, discovered a ladder to the top, verified that the water tank was full, and finally found the sack stuffed in the water faucet. All the boys gathered around the faucet to clear it. Suggestions from members of both groups were thrown at the problem, and boys from both sides tried to implement them. When the faucet was finally cleared, the Rattlers, who had canteens, did not object to the Eagles, who did not, taking the first turn at the faucets. No insults were hurled, not even the customary ladies first. It wasn't the end of the rivalry. There was another food fight with insults the next morning. But a few more common tasks requiring cooperation from both groups did the job, like restarting a stalled truck. At the end of the trip, the Rattlers used five dollars won in a bean toss contest to buy malts for all of the boys in both groups. The Robbers Cave experiment illustrates the psychology of hunter-gatherer bands echoed through time as perfectly as any experiment ever devised by social science. Any resemblance to modern politics is just your imagination. That's all for the Robbers Cave experiment, but because of how short it was on its own, I wanted to cover another uh, less wrong post as well, that I thought was particularly relevant. I was pleasantly surprised to rediscover that it started off with a recap of the Robbers Cave experiment, uh, which I'll go ahead and skip most of. <clears throat> so without further ado, here's the story of the two-party swindle. Recall that in the Robbers Cave experiment, each group developed a stereotype of itself and a contrasting stereotype of the opposing group, that the boys had been initially selected to be as similar as possible. The Rattlers swore heavily and regarded themselves as rough and tough. The Eagles swore off sparing and developed an image of themselves as proper and moral. Okay, so, consider the episode of the Blues and the Greens in the days of Rome. Since the time of the ancient Romans and continuing into the, area, the era of Byzantium and the Roman Empire, the Roman populace had been divided into the warring blue and green factions. Blues murdered Greens and Greens murdered Blues, despite all attempts at policing. They died in single combats, in ambushes, in group battles, in riots. 
from uh, Procopius's History of the Wars 1. In every city, the population has been divided for a long time past into the blue and the green factions. And they fight against their opponents, knowing not for what end they imperil themselves. So there grows up in them, against their fellow men, a hostility which has no cause, and at no time has it ceased or disappeared. For it gives place neither to the ties of marriage, nor of relationship, nor of friendship. In the case of the same, even though those who differ with respect to these colors be brothers or any other kin. From Edward Gibbon's The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, the support of a faction became necessary to every candidate for civil or ecclesi ecclesiastical honors. So who were the Blues and the Greens? They were sports fans, partisans of the blue and green chariot racing teams. It's less surprising if you think of the Robbers Cave experiment. Favorite team is us, rival team is them. Nothing more is ever necessary to produce fanatic enthusiasms for us and great hatreds of them. People pursue their sports allegiances with all the desperate energy of 200 gatherer bands lined up for battle, cheering as if their very life depended on it, because 50,000 years ago, it did. <clears throat> Evolutionary psychology produces strange echoes in time as adaptations continue to execute long after they cease to maximize fitness. Sex with condoms, taste buds still chasing sugar and fat, rioting basketball fans, and so the fans of favorite football team all praise their favorite players to the stars and derogate the players on hated rival team. We are the fans and players on the favorite football team. They are the fans and players on hated rival team. Those are the two opposing tribes, right? And yet, <clears throat> the professional football players from favorite team have a lot more in common with the professional football players from rival team than either has in common with the truck driver screaming cheers at the top of his lungs. The professional football players live similar lives, undergo similar training regimens, move from one team to the other. They're much more likely to hang out at the expensive hotel rooms of fellow football players than to share a drink with a truck driver in his rented trailer home. Whether favorite, favorite team or rival team wins, it's professional football players, not truck drivers, who get the girls, the spotlights, and above all, the money. Professional football players are paid a hell of a lot more than truck drivers. Why are professional football, football players uh, better paid than truck drivers? Because the truck driver divides the world into favorite team and rival team. That's what motivates him to buy the tickets and to wear the t-shirts. The whole money-making system would fall apart if people started seeing the world in terms of professional football players versus spectators. And I'm not even objecting to professional football. Group identification is pretty much the service provided by football players. And since that service can be provided to many people simultaneously, salaries are naturally competitive. Fans pay for tickets voluntarily, and everyone knows the score. <clears throat> it would be a very different matter if your beloved professional football players held over you the power of taxation and war, prison and death then it might not be a good idea to lose yourself in the delicious rush of group identification. Back in the good old days when knights were brave and peasants starved, there was little doubt the government and the governed were distinct classes. Everyone simply took for granted that this was the natural order of things. This era did not vanish in an instantaneous flash. Magna Carta did not challenge the obvious natural distinction between nobles and peasants, but it suggested the existence of a contract bargain, two sides of the table rather than one, when it said that no free man shall be taken or imprisoned or be diseased of his free freehold or liberties or free customs or be outlawed or exiled or any otherwise destroyed, nor will we uh, not pass upon him nor condemn him but by lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. We will sell to no man, we will not deny or defer to any man, either justice or right. <coughs> England did not replace the House of Lords with the House of Commons when the notion of an elected legislature was first being floated. They both exist side by side to this day. 
the American War of Independence did not begin as a revolt against the idea of kings, but rather a revolt against one king who would overstep his authority and violate the compact. And then someone suggested a really wild idea. And this comes from Decision in Philadelphia, the Constitutional Convention of 1787. The delegates to the Constitutional Convention, quote, had grown up believing in a somewhat different principle of government. The idea of the social contract, which said that government was a bargain between the rulers and the ruled. <coughs> the people, in essence, agreed to accept the overlordship of their kings and governors. In return, the rulers agreed to respect certain rights of the people. But as the deb debate progressed, a new concept of government began more and more to be tossed around. It abandoned the whole idea of the contract between rulers and the ruled as a philosophic basis for the government. It said instead that the power resided solely in the people. They could delegate as much as they wanted to and withdraw it as they saw fit. All members of the government, not just legislators, would represent the people. The Constitution, then, was not a bargain between the people and whoever ran the new government, but a delegation of certain powers to the new government, which the people could revise whenever they wanted. End quote. That was the theory, but did it work in practice? Well, in some ways, it obviously, it did work. I mean, the presidency of the United States uh, doesn't work like the monarchies of olden times, when the crown passed from father to son, or when a queen would succeed the king, her husband. But that's not even the important question. Forget that Congress people on both sides of the divide are more likely to be lawyers than truck drivers. Forget that in training and in daily life, they have far more in common with each other than they do with a randomly selected US citizen from their own party. Forget that they are more likely to hang out at each other's expensive hotel rooms than drop by your house. Is there a political divide? A divide of policies and interests between professional politicians on the one hand and voters on the other? Well, let me put it this way. <clears throat> Suppose that you happen to be socially liberal and fiscally conservative. Who would you vote for? Or simplify it further. Suppose that you're a voter who prefers a smaller, less expensive government. Should you vote Republican or Democratic? Or let's be, let's be accused of color favoritism. Suppose that your voter preference is to get US troops out of Iraq. Should you vote Democratic or Republican? One needs to be careful at this point to keep track of the distinction between marketing materials and historical records. I'm not asking which political party stands for the idea of a smaller government, which football team has go, go, smaller government, go, 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 is one of its cheers, or troops out of Iraq, yay. Rather, over the last several decades, among Republican politicians and Democratic politicians, which group of professional politicians shrunk the government while it was in power? And by shrunk, I mean shrunk. If you're suckered into an angry, shouting fight over whether your politicians or their politicians grew the government slightly less slowly, it means you're not seeing the divide between the politicians and the voters. There isn't a grand conspiracy to expand the government, but there's an incentive for each individual politician to send pork to campaign contributors and to borrow today against tomorrow's income. And that creates a divide between the politicians and the voters as a class for reasons that have nothing to do with colors and slogans. Imagine two football teams. The green team's professional players shout the battle cry, cheaper tickets, cheaper tickets, as they rush into the game. The blue team's professional players shout, better seating, better seating, as they move forward. The green spectators likewise cry, cheaper tickets. And the blue spectators, of course, cheer, <coughs> better seating. And yet, every year, the price of the tickets goes up, the seats get harder and less comfortable. The Blues win a football game, and a great explosion of better seating, better seating rises to the heavens with great shouts of excitement and glory. And then, the next year, the cushions have been replaced by cold steel. The Greens kick a long-range field goal, and the Green spectators leap up and down and hug each other, screaming, cheaper tickets, hooray, cheaper tickets. And then tomorrow, it's a $5 cost increase. It's not that there's a conspiracy. No conspiracy is required. Not even dishonesty is required. It's so painful to have to lie consciously. 
But somehow, after the blue, professional football players have won the latest game, and they're just about to install some new cushions, it occurs to them that, you know, they'd rather be at home drinking a nice cold beer. So they exchange a few furtive, guilty looks, scurry home, and apologize to the blue spectators the next day. As for the blue spectators catching on, <clears throat> that's not very likely. See, one of the cheers of the green side is, even if the blues win, they won't install new seat cushions. So if a blue, if a blue spectator says, hey, blue players, we cheered real hard and you won the last game. What's up with the cold steel seats? And all the other, all the other blue spectators will stare aghast and say, why are you calling a green cheer? And the lowly dissenter says, no, no, you don't understand. I'm not cheering for the greens. I'm just pointing out as a fellow spectator with an interest in better seating that professional football players who are allegedly on the blue spectator side haven't actually. What do you mean? Cry the blue spectators. Listen, you can hear the players calling it now. Better seating. It resounds from the Raptors. How can you say our players aren't true blue? Do you want the green players to win? You, you're betraying our team by criticizing our players. This is what I mean <clears throat> by the two-party swindle. Once a politician gets you to identify with them, they pretty much own you. It doesn't have to be a conscious, collaborative effort by your politicians and their politicians to keep the voters screaming at each other so that they won't notice the increasing gap between the voters and the politicians. It doesn't have to be a conspiracy. It emerges from the interests of the individual politicians uh, in getting you to identify with them instead of judging them. The problem dates back to olden times. Commoners identifying with kings was one of the great supporters of the monarchy. The commoners in France and England alike might be cold and starving, and the kings of France and England, England alike <clears throat> might be living in palaces, drinking from golden cups. But hey, the king of England is our king, right? His glory is our glory. Long live King uh, Henry the whatever. But as soon as you manage to take an emotional step back, started to think of your king as a contractor rather than cheering him because of the country he symbolized, <coughs> you started to notice the king wasn't a very good employee. And dare I say, the big mess is not likely to be cleaned up until the Republic fans, the Demo fans, realize that in many ways they have more in common with other voters than with their politicians, or at the very least, until they stop enthusiastically cheering for rich lawyers because they wear certain colors and begin judging them as employees, severely derelict in their duties. Until then, the wheel will turn, one sector rising and one sector falling, with a great tumult of lamentation and cheers, and turn again with uninhibited cries of joy or apprehension, turn again and again, and not go anywhere. Getting emotional over politics as though it were a sports game Identifying with one color and screaming cheers for them while keeping abuse on the other team's fans is a very good thing for the professional players' team, not so much for team voters. And that is the two-party swindle. These posts on Less Wrong are uh, both part of the sequence called Politics is the Mind Killer. In the article of the same name, Eliezer Yukowski writes, quote, people go funny in the head when talking about politics. The evolutionary reasons for this are so obvious as to be worth belaboring. In the ancestral environment, <clears throat> politics was a matter of life and death, and sex, and wealth, and allies, and reputation. When today, you get into an argument about, about whether we ought to, for example, raise the minimum wage, you're executing adaptations for an ancestral environment where being on the wrong side of an argument could get you killed. Politics is an extension of war by other means. Arguments are soldiers. Once you know which side you're on, you must support all arguments of that side, and attack all arguments that appear to favor the enemy side. Otherwise, it's like stabbing your soldiers in the back, providing aid and comfort to the enemy. People who would be level-headed about even-handedly weighing all sides of an issue in their professional life as scientists can suddenly turn into slogan-chanting zombies when there's a blue or green position on the issue. End quote. So, Let's not be slogan-chanting zombies, shall we? We, who are interested in the truth, must strive to evaluate ideas on their merits without concern for which teams chant which cheers. If we want to believe
believe things that are true and disbelieve things that are false, then party loyalty is problematic. As far as is possible, we need to work to align our emotions and our social incentives to reward changing our beliefs to align with the truth, no matter what that ends up being, even if it goes against the tribe's preferred narrative. We need to enjoy and celebrate the feeling of changing our mind for good, solid reasons, and to celebrate and reward that in our social groups as well. So, in closing, I'll leave you with a line from Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. The world's greatest fool may say the sun is shining, but it doesn't make it dark out. 